Well, lots to think about. Um, but uh, essentially, what's uh, that we didn't hear about also, especially uh, Africa, hmm? uh, and and where in principle would this quote unquote um, growth come from, globally speaking, in a sense of uh, if we are to remain global, um, are the people who currently hold the power, uh, do they see themselves as remaining global? But that's an, uh, we can have that conversation uh, over the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes or so, as I'm sure there are lots of questions. So floor's open. Um, I'll take uh, Neelan, uh, then Zoravar, and then wouldn't come up yet. Easier and speak on the microphone because otherwise. Uh, so mine is probably a very simple question because I'm not an economist. Uh, so if I look at uh, some of the rhetoric that's coming out of the U.S., it seems that one of the primary targets is the labor market, outsourcing of jobs, so on and so forth. And Therefore, it seems that one of the targets is precisely what seems to be a comparative advantage in India, although India perhaps hasn't used it very well, which is labor abundance. So you've made an argument that, you know, we need to think about export-led growth. Do you think that uh, this is, that despite the rhetoric, labor abundance is an advantage that India will be able to use in the near future? And if not, um, are there other strategies involved here uh, that can sustain the level of export-led growth that you sort of envision? Uh, thanks, Arvind. That was a terrific presentation. So uh, I'm quite interested in the comparative uh, uh, participation of the emerging economy, so India and China. So when you look at China's entry, such an extensive integration with the international economy, yet its dependence on international finance was always compensated by a very high savings rate internally. In India, and I think you alluded to this, the dependence on international finance is disproportionately higher than, let's say, other emerging economies. And I'm, I'm beginning to see that that's, in a sense, uh, we, we sort of facing the consequences where, where we haven't been able to manage that. You see the state of India, Inc., and its balance sheets. and. Perhaps, do we need a, a, a different type of an economic strategy where you calibrate your involvement? Secondly, related with this is, uh, if, your, if your main focus or your interest in the international economy is drawing in capital because you need to boost up, because let's say uh, we, we know the state in India uh, is the one that absorbs domestic savings primarily. So, so that additional incremental boost to the private sector is coming from international finance. Now, if that's the interest, trade becomes sort of a second-order aspect in this. And I'm talking of the domestic political economy actors. The trade is something where, okay, you have the value-added chains and they are generating their own, but there isn't a whole lot of export-oriented political economy in a sense. It's more a finance-oriented political economy. So I'm just trying to understand how you could... Yeah. Hi, sir. Thanks for the talk. Uh, basically, I wanted to ask you that you were talking about the protectionist sentiments which didn't arise in, arose in U.S. during the Chinese imports. One thing which I was noticing was uh, before the financial crisis that the U.S. economy was growing at a good rate. However, at the same time, the inflation was stable. And uh, given that, I think the Federal Reserve, maybe Alan Greenspan, he was able to keep the interest rate low, which in itself helped sustain the economy, but it later turned out to be kind of a bubble, as can be noticed in the housing bubble scenario. So do you think that was a, one of the factors that they might have thought like everything is going merry, so let it be? And at the same time, they were pretty happy with the inflation being stable because of the trade-off which they might have felt. Uh, secondly, you were talking about India's economic growth of 8%. One thing which I was just going through the Indian economic scenario. So basically, with banking sectors having stressed assets in, the se in terms of loans which they have passed on to the corporate sector, at the same time with the government saying that we want to be much more fiscally responsible, and then the third factor being the exchange rate appreciation. And the only burden which comes down on India is the domestic consumption in that sense to sustain the economic growth. 
and now with the the federal reserve uh, there's like a chance that the interest rate might start rising in us because it's in a good phase now so do you think uh, will india in itself be able to sustain the growth rate which it has right now maybe in 3 4 years given the fact that india's exchange rate is appreciating and how it will need to come out of it if exports in itself kind of suffer in the future thank you thank you yeah so first on before uh, only because i might forget the questions and uh, um so so i i i think that you know starting backwards <clears throat> i mean i i don't think we can sustain 8% for 20 years based on domestic consumption no way no country has done it i mean it's not a, a an ideology it's just a, you look at japan china korea taiwan uh, 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 all the others they were all are done this so i i think it's very uh, difficult to sustain that now on china and the us was it because inflation actually what is interesting is 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 uh, you know among many things what is what you said but i think in terms of the political economy what happened in the united states was see i, I kind of over exaggerated during that period there was a lot of you know angst against china on the exchange rate so in congress for about 5 7 years you know repeatedly you know chuck schumer and others said you know let's impose a, a, a tax uh, on imports to countervail you know chinese exchange rate policy but essentially that never never got off the ground because american capital was invested in china and american capital always blocked anything against you know any action against china so essentially china by you know, and that was the difference between china and japan japan had you know was exporting but japan never uh, and it exported goods and fdi of course fdi came later but china imported american fdi co-opted american capital so that whenever there was a thing against china the, the 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 business lobby would speak up and so you never got any action in china so it was masterful in that way i mean china imported fdi because it wanted the fdi you know and opening up the zones and so on but it also had this powerful political economy backing uh, when all these things came up uh, in the united states now you raise a, i i think a, a a very good point and it's something that is kind of maybe too dear to my heart um which is that see i i don't i mean i don't know if i should get a bit philosophical and historical about this is that i think that intellectually and i think this permeates the whole indian ecosphere i think we are still you know our mindset is dominated by 1950s poverty thinking which is poor country doesn't have savings need savings from abroad it has i would say been very detrimental to our development strategy including exactly the point that you raised you see up to a point these things may be cultural and so on and so on but the chinese increase in savings you know they maybe started off at some point but they went from i don't know 25 about may 25 30 to 40 45 as a result of the policies they followed and because of the kind of policies they followed i e they they kept the exchange rate from appreciating they kept capital closed uh they you know mercantilism lots of exports which generated its own savings so the the, the mindset were in thrall to what i call this you know 50 savings thing savings are endogenous to growth the way it happens is basically is that you grow rapidly and your farms do so well that corporate savings really increases quite a lot the same thing happened in india i in the period when we grew from you know whatever 8% 9% our savings rate shot up by 10 percentage points so there's nothing kind of deeply cultural about you know oh my god you know we are a low saving and there are high saving up to a point it's true but after that it's determined by what we do and i think it's precisely because we lost sight of that or we never internalized the lessons of that that to some extent we've been dominated by this oh my god we need foreign capital otherwise we won't grow uh, and successive governments have done i think intellectual damage uh, to our thing you know uh, all this thing about you know you know it it really bothers me that a growth framework is still like a imf spreadsheet which completely ignores the experience of east asian history of the last 25 years where the binding constraint is investment not savings if you get the investment and growth the savings will come 
And in the case of the East Asians, the savings came pouring out of the earth so much that they exported it in droves to the United States and, and other places like that. So I think uh, there is a kind of intellectual problem there. Now, uh, your, your question, see, firstly, the American rhetoric is mercifully still much worse than the action. You know, uh, so far at least we've not seen, you know, egregious, you know, tr uh, trade restrictions or egregious restrictions on H-1B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's wait and watch. I think that uh, uh, um, if it continues like this, maybe, you know, the political carrying capacity is kind of constant, and if we can gain market share, we can do that. But that's a kind of easy, but supposing you're true, supposing it does play out, that you know world markets close does that mean we have to rely on something else than our you know abundant labor see remember that even until so far we've actually only relied on our scarce skilled labor than our abundant labor and and to some extent that model is kind of running out of steam because our skilled labor supply is not as so so my answer is that you know, any model that relies on a scarce labor is not going to be sustainable over 20, 25 years. I mean, the way I think about the Indian development model is that, you know, China was a Lewis development model for 30, 35 years, and then the Lewis curve turned up. Our model, the Lewis curve has turned up on, on services, you know, 20 years ahead of what China's did. It's not sustainable. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I wanted to know what you thought of work of scholars like Land Pritchard and Michael Clemens, who argue that um, there is an economic efficiency angle to uh, the elimination of barriers to not just trade and capital restrictions, but also labor flows. And if you would put this in the same camp as, you know, this is all hyper-globalist um, talk, then how would you rationalize that with um, Indian government schemes at the moment which are trying to find markets for their labor abroad. Is there another way to go about it then? See, uh, yeah, uh, groups of three. Huh? Groups of three. <laughs> yes, sir, I'm Sanjay Yadav. Uh, while I agree with most of the points that you made, I thought sufficient stress on political issues which underline these developments. Globalization and anti-globalization seem to me only ideologies. Uh, if, if they promote one's political power, they would be supported. And if you know, they are seen to undermine one's political power or weaken one's political power, then hostility would grow towards uh, globalization. So I, although I agree with most of the points, I mean, I thought there was insufficient stress on the political relationships with which underline this and as far as India is concerned if India were to grow at eight point uh, whatever for a long period that would certainly undermine international relationships and we can uh, to 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 enable that we have to have more accommodative uh, policies and, and and here the most important thing would be to go easy on our right to immigrate because nothing affects uh, the whole DNA of a society as much as migration. And the, the way we are insisting that Indians should have a right to immigrate to the U.S. or U.K., I think that's outrageous. That we have to be accommodative on this because immigration is, from our own domestic politics, we should know whether it's Shiv Sena in Mumbai or Assam or JNK or Uttarakhand or anywhere. We should know that migration is critical to any society. And it's, we have to be accommodative and go easy on our right to immigrate. And, and we need political policies which are more accommodative, and that might facilitate good economic relations. China was only able to rise because it was seen as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, and that promoted inflows and all. And now, when they become hostile, it's inevitable that you know the economy will also slow down as, polit as economic relations which are an outcome of that will. So I think we have to be more accommodative on the immigration issue, and I think political factors underline this. So, uh, Arvind, as usual, a brilliant, uh, exuberant presentation. 
I can expect nothing less. But and I agree with the, your bottom line at the end that we've been hyperglobalization. We've been here before. Every 15 years, we come down. In fact, I brought a thing uh, from 15 years ago exactly. The scenarios for 2020 prepared by Shell. We talk about hyperglobalization versus another one. The interesting thing there was that the model which we started off the conventional, very similar to what you would say the dominant thinking. It turns out in the other one, the in this indices of globalization uh, were actually performed as well in terms of trade integration and others in the sort of what you are calling globalization. So, but I, the key points that you have, I think is a very important one, and I wish you, hope you can take it forward, is that the issue about finance fetish. Now here I think there is a political economy of finance, but recently there have been a whole bunch of papers um, and even academic tests, I'm thinking of books, um, I can mention a couple, but basically finance is invisible, and overall, it's parasitic, I, and I am using that word very deliberately, is highly underestimated in the West and surprisingly in India. And I, I will mention that. The difference between China, just to give you an example, China and India's in dependence on foreign capital is China imported Main Street capital, business, and that India has been dependent on finance capital, Wall Street, portfolio. And even within sectors, let's take when we talk about policy, e-commerce, there's a big hullabaloo about foreign ownership, whether or airlines. But we don't worry about effective control when it's foreign funded. So this finance fetish actually is quite complex and actually very deep rooted. And I, I think it's really a, a disaster for the country. So that's a comment. I disagree with you a little bit on the part about export dependence. I think your numbers, if you work them out in value added terms, in the period where we had very high export growth, and then you look at, so I agree with you that growth leads to savings increase, but in terms of trade and as a driver for growth, break it into five, 10 years uh, sort of episodes. I think for the, the C plus I domestic, it, over the next five, 10 years has a much greater dri uh, growth driving potential than an export led thing. Um, I think basically need for more granularity. I have something on, for example, services exports are totally misunderstood because we aggregate them too much. It's really not, uh, and you know, to understand what is the cause of the troubles of our IT uh, sector means some of our actually what we may be pushing for may have been the wrong thing. So uh, lastly, your what your champions of this are basically the old theory is that you're basically saying the middle powers have to somehow seek more control over the destiny over the two major powers. Uh, that's, but then you think about, let me give you examples of Turkey and perhaps even Canada. And then you see the, some of the challenges that come and that sort of comes back to, you need to integrate the political a little more uh, with the political economy. So. Yeah, many more than three actually, but. So, so um, let, let me, I mean, there were kind of two related questions on, on, on migration. Um, <clears throat> see, uh, I, I think that um, Michael and, and Lance's work on, on migration are, um, you know, uh, spot on. I, I, I think that uh, Danny Roderick's kind of twist on that is that essentially, if you look at the wedges, you know, the, the restrictions, Basically now, trade and finance are kind of re, uh, pretty much integrated. So the, the, the de facto restrictions are very small. So the incremental bang for buck is actually very little. In the case of labor, the wedges are so huge. I mean, something like maybe uh, like a tariff equivalent of 300, 400% that small reductions in that which do not lead to huge surges of flows can still be very beneficial because these markets are so distorted in the first place. Uh, so I think that that is, is absolutely right. However, I mean, uh, for me, it's still a, a, a problem and a puzzle from a political economy sense that, you know, if this is the backlash, which is mostly driven by labor market things, 
I mean, I don't know how it's going to be easy to make the case that, you know, you know, don't get uh, goods in, but get more people in. Uh, I, I don't know how that's going to be easy to do. So uh, uh, while I see the, the case for it, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I'm not sure the political economy of that is going to be easier than the political economy of, of, of trade. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit, bit puzzled by, by, by what you said, but let me say that, you know, and, and you should read, uh, we came and presented this on the economic survey. In terms of internal migration, I think, you know, we need to have as much of it as possible, uh, like China did. And I think we are getting more and more uh, of that, which I think is uh, eminently desirable. Should we sympathize on someone else's behalf and say, we must uh, restrict, uh, uh, you know, people from going abroad? Uh, I think there's a whole human rights angle to it, which I don't want to get into. But I do think that people think of this in somewhat narrow terms. I think Indian exports of labor and, you know, H-1B and so on, the impact has, of this has been much greater than whatever these people have earned in terms of the reputational advantages that India has enjoyed because of these people have worked, in terms of the circulatory flow of talent, know-how, and thing that's happened, it's been enormous. So I think from India's point of view, it's absolutely unambiguously in our interest to have our people going abroad, and, and you know, luckily now they come back as well. So to maintain the flow of, of uh, people more and more in a circulatory fashion, I think is, is absolutely crucial to our uh, uh, long run uh, uh, growth. I think that on the, you know, I, I, I agree that maybe there wasn't enough attention to the political issues. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we should think about this much more. Uh, on on the, the finance fetish, you know, I, I, I think that, but I don't agree with your final conclusion. I mean, if you say going forward, see, in terms of desirability and the, and the evidence, there's no question that it has to be export-led growth. No country has done 8% just on domestic demand. So if you are saying that no exports are going to be closed because all that's going to happen, and willy-nilly we have to focus on this, then we have to be resigned to you know 5 6% growth, because that's an inevitable consequence. It's not going to change. So, so, but in terms of strategy, what does it mean? In terms of strategy, does it mean we must go back to import substitution? Because the only thing that says, oh, focus on the domestic market, because if you're competitive internationally, you can focus on the domestic market. So when you say focus on the domestic market, do you mean we have to actually go back to some form of import substitution industrial policy? I, I, I my instinct is, is not to go in that direction, but I think we can, we can you know, de debate that uh, for a long time. <clears throat> Uh, uh, some time back, uh, I had gone to uh, China, and there was a very interesting presentation made by a former governor of the uh, the Development Bank of China, and he was trying to explain how is it that China has actually had that period of very high growth, double-digit growth, longer than say Japan has had or some of the other uh, other uh, miracle economies in East Asia have had. And he identified three elements which were different from the experience of others. So the first he said was that, <clears throat> you know, uh, domestic savings, very high rate, but domestic saving which in terms of bank deposits with only 3% deposit rate, lending rate which the, uh, which the state was able to determine. So funneling of money, for example, to very large infrastructure projects, risk element actually being very high, but actually the rate at which the lending was done was very low. So that allowed the infrastructure to develop very, very rapidly. Second, that with, uh, and, and this he said was a peculiarly Chinese phenomena, that land in China is owned by the state. It is only leased out even when the agricultural reforms took place. Uh, land was leased out for 30 years or 50 years to the farmers, but land never was, ownership was never given. There, the government was able, the state was able to mobilize, state not only in terms of the central government, but also in terms of local entities, municipalities, etc., were able to mobilize very large sums of money for investment, 
from the change in land use. So, I mean, of course, that created problems later on in terms of the indebtedness of these local entities. But over a period of time, a very large amount of money was mobilized through this, which is not something which, say, in a country like India would be uh, possible. And the third element, he said, was that even though foreign investment played a very important part, it was one particular component of foreign investment from what he called Greater China, that is Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, which really put gave an additionality which we would not have otherwise had. So foreign direct investment, say from Japan and Western countries, was important not so much for the money but for the technology part, but the actual bulk of the FDI actually came from the Greater China. And he said it is these three particular elements which actually explain why the Chinese experience, growth experience, is probably not replicable elsewhere. Uh, no, uh, there was one question from the Yakam. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know what you thought about the recent work of uh, Branko Milanovic at the World Bank, especially the, 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 the paradox he highlights within globalization, right? That that period of hyperglobalization, I mean, where, whereby global inequality decreases, but that's at the cost of national inequality rising. So most of the winners of that hyperglobalization are the Chinese and Indian middle classes and the top 1% of the world, and the losers are the middle classes of developed countries. And perhaps a lot of the, 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 the nativist national movement, right, the Trump, etc., the Pen come from precisely the, 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 the losers of globalization, right? people that have suffered from this hyper-globalization period. And it's interesting, during the, the debate that happened this week between Macron and Le Pen, at some point Macron told her, oh, but you, you, who are you going to, in what world are you going to live? You have, and she said, oh, you know, you, Macron, represent the past of inter, uh, regional integration. There are a lot of people in the world that are changing this, especially Russia and India. So, <laughs> so she, she painted India as a country that is refusing regional integration in the name of nationals, etc. And uh, yeah, perhaps I want to know what you thought about this and whether if this period of hyperglobalization starts again, perhaps, you know, if you know, the rates of return on capital rise again, how are we? Sh how do we know that this is not going to happen again? The same spiral of crisis and you know, etc. Uh, yeah, yeah. We are also in a different world now, in the sense that uh, the time when Japan, Korea, Taiwan sort of grew very fast, it was a different world. They could use the exchange rate. And the world was quite different. And also there was no overhang of capacity that exists today, especially with China having huge overhang of capacity. So how do we contend with it? While, while the point that we need high exports, high growth rate on exports to grow is well taken, uh, there, are, there are constraints which are very clear. That is the kind of overhang which is there. And their share in the fastest growing area of manufacture, take electronics. China today occupies something like not less than 40 or 50 percent. You take the code number in the ISIC, it's 40 or 50 percent and not less. It's, it's the dominant producer across board. So how do you do with, and, and all of them, they've got an overhang of capacity. And second is that, take the case of mining equipment, all the heavy engineering equipment. Their mining boom corresponded with the growth in the mining equipment in China. Their growth in IT consumption grew along with the IT manufacture, I mean, electronics manufacture. That spin-off doesn't exist here. So how do you deal with these two kinds of issues? Uh, again, uh, great questions. And uh, um, OK, on, let me start backwards again, yeah? Uh, two or three things, right? I mean, in principle, uh, two, three responses, right? In principle, it's not a zero-sum game. I mean, after all, if we were as competitive as China, uh, you know, on electronics, whatever, whatever, we could also be exporting out there. So, so your thing is a kind of, you know, uh, what we would call the lump of labor fallacy that, you know, if one country grows, the other country cannot go. I mean, uh, but, you know, had we been competitive, 
it wouldn't be right. So the problem is our competitive not in China's growth. Second thing is that even if I conceded your thing, I mean, China is vacating clothing and textiles. China is vacating uh, footwear. I mean, why can't we get those? And in manufacturing, we are, that's why I, I, I want to, in the box, I wanted to, in the, in, the, in the survey, want to kind of see this at a global level. So even if India grew, you know, 10, uh, you know, at 15% thing, as a share of world thing, we're still very small. So, so I, I don't think there's a kind of fixed pie which you know we're uh, you know uh, kind of competing against. Uh, that you know maybe 20 years down the road in services, if we grow at 20 percent, then we may run up against some of these constraints. But at this stage, it doesn't. But I would add that certainly uh, the, the the next Chinas of the world, it will be easier if China, uh, you know cooperates. If China continues mercantilism, it is going to be a problem in that sense. So in that sense, uh, I, I think you are right. But th that's not, I think, at, at, at this stage for India, the, the primary problem. On, on Branco's famous, you know, elephant curve, you know, um, um, I, I think it's a nice descriptive device. Uh, and I think it captures uh, the essential. See, remember that, to me, it's clear that, you know, you know in, in a way, inequality within countries is rising uh, everywhere. And I think that those are domestic challenges that we have to face. But I think it's fantastic uh, that uh, not just the middle class in China, but also, you know, uh, you know, bottom deciles in India and China are catching up with advanced countries. So the process of convergence for me uh, I care about, you know, the, the process of convergence, you know, uh, you know, spreading within India. Uh, of course, you know, we'll have our inequality issues and so on, which we have to deal with. Uh, but, but the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we are growing rapidly and, and, you know, catching up is something unambiguously, you know, to something to celebrate. Uh, where, you know, middle class uh, weight stagnation and inequality in the U.S. matters, is then what it does for our own ability to achieve that, you know, in terms of will they go more precarious protection and so on. I actually, you know, will this hyper-globalization repeat itself? That, I, I know, uh, I, I'm not so sure it can happen uh, to the extent that it did because I, I just don't think, you know, a 20 percent increase in export to GDP uh, is sustainable politically, internationally. So I, I doubt whether we're going to have this. That's why I said hyper-globalization is probably dead. But I think we can, you know, chug along uh, steadily or, you know, e even if it's flat, uh, I I'm happy with that. Because I, I do think the Branco phenomenon of rising inequality within countries will at some stage place a check on even our ability to, you know, via protectionism and all those things. So I think uh, it is. Now, Sham, I... You know, this is not the, the time to get into, you know, the Chinese development strategy and so on. Um, I, I think all that you said, most of what you said, uh, I agree with, certainly the land owned by the state. I mean, huge difference with India. But I think on the domestic savings part, if you go back and look at, you know, Japan at a comparable period of time, Korea at a comparable period of time, Taiwan at a comparable period of time, and China in 1978. I think domestic savings rates were not very, very. Yeah. So his point was that there is a 10% extra that China has, which is not an issue. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm coming to that. So, 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 uh, uh, so then we come to you know the financial repression part of the story. See, <laughs> remember that, you know, in the old days when what was this? Uh, who did the uh, for original financial repression? Uh, McKinnon. Uh, McKinnon and well, there's one more person. Sure, Sean McKinnon, Sean, Sean McKinnon. Remember in the old days when we, they did financial repression, they told us that financial repression would lead to reduced savings. If you kept interest rates low, you, you, get, you got reduced savings. So, so I think that essentially financial repression as a way of keeping credit cheap is something India has also done. You know, we also have a highly financially repressive, repressive economy. Uh, but the point is that they've been able to pull it off and we've not been able to pull it off. So I think it speaks to, I think, something much deeper, which I think is distinctive about China. I think all that you've said are, I think, manifestations of something that is, you know, deep. And the deeper point is that I think the Chinese Communist Party and whatever successors, I mean, state capacity in China 
is just incredible. I, I think their ability to deliver infrastructure, health, education, and basic things has been phenomenal in a way that we've not been able to. And I think that deeper thing is what really distinguishes China uh, from India. But you know, but you know, we can argue about that. There are alternative, you know, hypotheses as well. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, my name is Hitendra. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, uh, the question is that uh, uh, in uh, in case of China, I mean, is it the political system there which have which makes a strong contribution to uh, its competitiveness? So that is my question. The political system. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what do you mean by that? I mean, what, do you mean that? What do you mean by that? Is it because? they are able to subsidize exports? Is, is, is that, I mean, because it can manifest itself in several ways, right? I mean, if the political system better delivers infrastructure, then they are more competitive, you know, by virtue of having, you know, delivered better infrastructure. So what exactly do you mean by that? That the government is able to do a lot of things which probably we will not be able to do. Yeah, that, I, that, that I, I said, you know, the, the, the state capacity angle of China is just incredible. I mean, I think they're able to do so many things that we're not able to do. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, we also try to subsidize and protect and all these things, you know. So, you know, uh, but we haven't been able to pull it off as successfully as China. No, the question is that uh, we will not be able to do those things because of the system. That's what. So do you think that's correct? Huh? I think you're saying capitalist versus socialist. No, I, I, think, I think what he means is a kind of a democracy, yeah, a democracy tax, as it were. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, may, maybe, you know, one should have a discussion about the democ democracy tax. You know, if you read Chapter 2 of the Economic Survey, I go into some of this a little bit. I think there is something to the democracy tax. I, 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 the fact that We've had to redistribute at a stage in development uh, because of being a democracy, but without having the state capacity to deliver that. I think that has imposed a lot of inefficiencies uh, on the Indian economy. So there is a democracy tax, uh, I think. But I think it's, it's more complicated, uh, uh, and I don't want to get into this, you know, democracy, good, democracy, bad, you know, capitalism, you know, communism, good, communism, bad kind of uh, 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 arguments. Uh, much more complicated than that, yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question is, I mean, what's the rationale behind this figure of 8%? Uh, I mean, uh, we can always follow the approach that this is what we can do, and this is what we can probably achieve given the world stays, uh, I mean, in X, Y, Z scenarios. Mm. And uh, we can quote those numbers. But how come we reached at a number of 8%? I mean, is it based on some expectations or uh, maybe or some political imperatives? Or is it that we have a rational, I mean, we have done some calculations uh, that this is what we will do and this is uh, what we'll be able to achieve? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, th I think that, you know, the 8, I think, I suspect partly comes from the fact that we did 8, 8 and a half for about an 8, 9 year period. Uh, so so I, I think we've shown we've done that. So we think that it is within reach. I think the other reason is that, you know, some, well, also the East Asian economies during their phase of rapid convergence did about 8%. So I, I think that's another kind of metric from where we get 8%. You know, if you look at the whole, all the East Asian convergers, China did, about, of course, did 10%, 10.5 for about 35 years. But the others have done somewhere between 8 and 10%. So that, I think, and the last, I think I would say, you know, we know that the more the growth, the more the dynamism, the more we'll be able to absorb and uh, provide opportunities for labor, etc. So in that sense, you know, more is better, but, you know, more within realistic limits and determined by some historical, our own experience and the experience of others who've done something like this. That's where I think the 8% comes from. Thanks. So the third question is uh, that uh, in hyper... Shall I? Okay. Uh, something that's really pressing at this point in time. Sure. Uh, so thank you, Arvind. I was just curious about one issue which sort of came up. At, at one issue, you sort of speak of hyperglobalization largely as the growth in exports beyond certain levels, export GDP ratios. And at another level, you referred briefly in passing to things like the TPP, etc., as hyperglobalization. That it's not so much a deepening as a horizontal expansion of globalization across different standards. But it's always been complicated in the sense that the entire TPP experience came out of uh, the American uh, attempt to level, quote-unquote, the playing field, uh, which uh, Trump sort of uh, 
uh, essentially goes against, which is seems to me to be an odd situation to be coming in. And once sort of better sense prevails, uh, wouldn't you at least expect some of that drivers around the TPP story sort of start coming back in? Because that seems to be um, something that's very much within the sphere of what these people are going through. And, and secondly, the other issue that you brought up, which for 30 years things were relatively quiet, and why is it that suddenly flat wages has become this major story? And that relates back to the other issues that sort of came up about domestic stuff that's sort of driving back which way we are looking at it today, uh, and how that will sort of affect, you know, uh, our chances of doing whatever we do. It's so f for a long part of those 30 years, you essentially uh, had relatively flat wages, but you had uh, generally robust employment and still limited inequality. It's only in the last decade or so that you have seen this, this rising 1% um, you know, story. Uh, and it's sort of, uh, so the question is therefore, is it, am I A, rebelling against this fact, or is it something that one is looking at uh, the success stories which are coming out are things that I cannot ever aspire to. There's a this gap sort of that sort of comes through in that particular space, uh, and the fact that the returns to education, which sort of, in some sense, uh, kept these workers more or less running in the same place. That the sort of human capital version went up, but their wages remained more or less, their wages remained more or less flat, and now, essentially. Uh, as you're moving out to a whole bunch of uh, service jobs and a deconstruction uh, of the labor force, you're seeing some of the precarity or the uncertainty that's usually associated with uh, unstable jobs. Not only flat, but you also have a degree of instability that comes from the gig economy, which then the two together sort of feeds back into this sense that something has to be stopped. Uh, and to that extent, what effect would, if this is A, do you agree with this? And if so, uh, what effect that you think that could have on your thing of maintaining on the WTO and a variety of other things that have come through? So actually, uh, both uh, very good questions, uh, Part. Uh, one is that I, I do think that uh, <clears throat> We probably we shouldn't write off TPP and TTIP as yet. Uh, I, I think these things <clears throat> may come back, you know, largely because, uh, you know, a lot of it is about you know what we call deep integration and not not trade. But you see, having said that, I can't see how. Remember, even TPP does involve some reduction of tariffs to the Vietnams uh, of the world. I think that in this environment, none of that is going to be possible. You know, the notion that you can reduce tariffs, you know, I think... It, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. So I think, so if you can put together something that's... So that's why I think TTIP may have a little bit more uh, play. Uh, because there it's all, you know, regulatory convergence and, and so on. I, I think that, that that's possible. <clears throat> TPP, remember, TPP for me was was a lot about a China pivot to China, uh, I mean, Asia and China. Now, these guys, I don't know how much they care about this. If they think this is, you know, retains importance, then that can come back into play. Because I, I, I think that you're absolutely right that you can only negotiate things that involve really no more opening up to emerging market or developing countries to anything. You know, that, that's not going to be possible at all uh, in this environment. So, but I do think it has legs. Let's not uh, rule it out. Especially, I think TTIP will have will have some legs. Um, on your, uh, you know, other point. See, I think 
that's why I said it's, it's a very complicated, there are many things going on. But you raise a very good point about timing. You see, wage stagnation basically has been going on since 1980, you know, right? And remember the first, uh, you know, the whole wage inequality debate happened in the early, in the mid 90s, Krugman's famous paper is mid 90s. That was in response to what happened uh, Japan, the Japanese surge. And so wage inequality started diverging uh, quite a bit. Um, the Piketty top 1% phenomenon, I agree, is more recent. The mobility point, uh, I think, certainly from what the Chetty research shows, has been happening for a long time, but it for some reason only become salient in the last five or ten years. So in terms of timing, the top 1% phenomenon, the, 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 the mobility phenomenon, all these, I think, have become more resonant in, in the last, uh, you know, five, ten years, and maybe th that's what explains the timing of this. I think that also the, the fact that global financial crisis, I think, also had an impact in terms of this whole, you know, the system is rigged, there are a bunch of guys, I mean, the irony is that, you know, that was the rhetoric, but, you know, the guys in power today are very much the, those same guys. But I think the rhetoric, I think the global financial crisis also changed something quite fundamental about uh, people's perception. So I think on timing, I think th there is a good question because some of these have been ongoing, but I think have only become salient more recently. Uh, and maybe that's what explains uh, 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 the timing. Uh, I think that also, um, r remember that labor market outcomes have been weak in the United States first in the 2000s and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, after the crisis again. So I I'm not sure about the labor market outcomes there. They have been, you know, uh, uh, it, it, the interesting thing is in Japan, where all this has happened, where consistently you've had almost full employment. Um, uh, so, so Japan is a different, see, in the U.S. And, and, and Europe, you've had, Europe especially, you've had very high unemployment uh, fluctuating. In the U.S., you've had not as high unemployment, but also fluctuating cyclically. In Japan, you've basically had full employment. Even during the period of, you know, the last uh, 22 decades or so, you've had pretty much things. But, but, but last point. But I do think that what is now salient now is this, you know, the, infor the, the, the kind of informalization of the economy, the sense of job insecurity. I think that, I think, is now becoming so much more salient. You know, we know that if you lose a job now, you know, even if you get your job back, you get it back at probably, you know, 60 to 70 percent of your previous wage. So, so there's all that go, uh, going on as well. So a lot of things happening and uh, difficult to, you know, pinpoint timing. Well, if I can just uh, ask you on Japan itself, that's a country which has basically had flat GDP growth. Whatever per capita growth has come through is largely because of a slowly declining population. And yet it seems to be a country or a culture which has sort of reconciled itself to the notion that their children will be as well off as them, but not better off, which seems to be still the norm that's pervading, let's say, other parts of the world. Right? But is, is it actually, but is it borne out in fact? That's what I don't know. I've seen the Chetty chart for the US. I've not seen it for Japan. It's the... On average, yes, I haven't seen the distributional movements as to whether they have stable in uh, structures. You should see the Chetty charts are just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen those? You know, like like because they have that uh, yeah. wonderful experiment. Yeah. So, so it, across the two, do you see Japan as being any different from any of the other OECD countries? I uh, see. I, I, I'll tell you. In, I'll tell you in what sense. Uh, there are two senses. You put your finger on one. I think there's another sense in which, you see. I I, I don't know whether. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know whether you've read Fukuyama's, you know, his uh, the end of history. You should all read the last part of it. The last man. It's actually even more interesting than you know the end of history. So. You know. I think what is different about Japan, because I don't know what the mobility numbers are, um, if they're different from the United States, then what you're saying is exactly right. I, and I think that's a big part of it. I think, as I said, in the US, that's become salient more recently. The second thing is that I think that l the fact that life at the frontier is going to be slow, 
dull, not very dynamic, is something that Jap Japanese somehow seem to be able to live with more easily than the Americans are able to. You know, by definition, if you're at the frontier, you know, incomes are going to grow much more slowly. Uh, somehow, the, the Japanese have gotten used to that notion, uh, which the Americans, because the sense that, you know, it has to be better and better, I, I think there is some cultural difference there that I think uh, you're onto something, which I think is possible, is possible between the two. But I think the last man, uh, Fukuyama's last man actually uh, um, s says that, I think the bottom line is that I don't think you can get used to, you know, the fact that if you're at the frontier, you, you can get used to, you know, life being slow because, you know, he has this lovely thing about the Edemos e e e uh, and how people will never kind of live with that. So it's very interesting. So thank you. And thank you so much for being so generous with your time.